Welcome to Thriller Premium. Welcome to Thriller Premium. In-depth coverage and timely analysis of macro and micro happenings in crypto and Bitcoin. Welcome to Thriller Insider. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls from around the world, welcome back to another exciting episode of Thriller Insider. Today is September 22nd, 2020, and we are talking the lost decade. As you know, earlier this year, the Federal Reserve printed about $3 trillion (laughs) of new money, and it didn't exactly go as planned, right? What happened was pretty simple. It went to the very concentrated wealth up there in the, you know, less than 1% of the world, and it basically inflated all of their assets. Uh, It was basically welfare for the rich, right? And what we're seeing now happen is this grown resentment amongst uh, a lot of people around the world. Um, And we're also seeing what looks to be an exit scam taking place uh, before our very eyes with BlackRock assisting the Fed with uh, delegating (laughs) where they see fit. And as all this is going on, we're seeing a momentous occasion occur right before our eyes where we have the Fed saying not only are they going to inflate the hell of the currency of the United States, but they're going to try to shoot over 2% finally. (laughs) And what they're planning on doing is creating this hyperinflation. And usually when hyperinflation occurs, um, the country gets laden with debt and interest rates are cut to zero, as is now the case with the U.S. And it was just announced last week by Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis President James Bullard. He said, we're at a moment where you may see some inflation. <laughs> you think you think, Mr. Bullard? <laughs> so it's it's quickly, quickly coming to a head here. And what all this means is we're headed towards a lost decade. And Japan experienced some of this after World War II. But what we're seeing here is the long-term debt cycle. And right now, among macro investors and alike, they're all talking about the same thing, how this long-term debt cycle reaches a turning point every like several decades. And we have to look back into history to kind of find out exactly how that kind of played out. And we have people who are very smart about this kind of stuff, like, uh, Ray Dalio, Ro Powell, uh, Lynn Alden, and just really brilliant thinkers of our time talking about how this is going to play out over this next decade. And we're going to slowly break down what this all means for crypto and Bitcoin going forward. And I think I have some original takes that no one else really has touched on. And I think because they're just not Bitcoin or crypto native, right? They didn't come from this space or be brought out of this space. Um, So what we're seeing right now in the Ethereum sector, especially, is just this whole financial industry getting rebuilt. (laughs) I mean, that's all it really is. Uh, A lot of the stuff is replacing the old legacy systems, and it will at some point here in the future. And if it's not Ethereum, it will be something else very similar like it. And we'll dive more into that as we go further into this episode. But right now at the top of the show, I want to dive into what Mike Maloney has produced over this past decade. Uh, You really should check out his YouTube channel. He has brilliant videos. I'm talking about like hours of videos on how this all works. So what I'm gonna do is play you a little snippet of something that he is able really to compact and show us how eerily similar Rome is to present day the United States of America. And not only that, right, but how we're literally falling into the same like problems <laughs> and this decadence of just luxury uh, for the very few percent. Um, it's crazy how how it just repeats itself. It's almost like freaking Neo and the Matrix <laughs> and the fourth version. Yeah, it's nuts, but let's take a listen.
In the early days of the Roman Republic, for the first 178 years, there's no evidence of big inflation. They were using gold and silver coinage mostly as their currency. Small denominations were made out of copper and bronze. Then Hannibal of Carthage starts to harass Rome in something called the Second Punic War. And to pay for this war, they did deficit spending by taking the coins that they took in in taxes, melting them down, and adding cheap and abundant base metals, such as copper, so that they could mint more coins. This caused a big inflation, and the inflation was one of the factors that brought the Roman Republic down to a dictatorship, the Roman Empire. Most of Rome's gold and silver was stored in vaults under the floor of their treasury, which was also known as the Temple of Saturn. If you visit Rome, go to the Forum in the center of the city, where you can still find the ruins of the temple today. And here's something I found really interesting. The U.S. Treasury in Washington, D.C. has almost exactly the same design. So now let's start filling in our timeline of events to keep track of the major similarities between Rome and the USA. We just learned that the early Roman Republic enjoyed a long period of practically no inflation because they used sound money, pure gold and silver. Interestingly, the United States started on the same path. From the late 1700s to the early 1900s, prices were very stable thanks to laws that mandated the use of gold and silver as money, and our people were not robbed by inflation. But in both instances, it was the ongoing debasement of the money for war spending and public works that led to economic chaos. Tell us the parallels between Rome and what's happening in the United States today. Well, they, they're obviously two very different societies, but uh, there, there are some broad parallels. Rome was a republic. They made sure they had two people each year who were the, the rulers, the consuls. They uh, always changed because the Romans were uh, worried. They'd had a, a monarchy before, very unpopular, and they overthrew it. So they didn't want anyone getting too, mu too, too many powers. Uh, what did in Rome, no surprise, excessive taxation and debasing the money. When you look at the coinage, it started out being an exact measure of copper for the sesterci and silver for the denarii, and by the time it was all over, worth absolutely nothing with perhaps a wash of silver to make it look like the original thing, which is exactly what we're doing now. So these patterns repeat themselves. They always repeat themselves. The Romans were the first culture to understand that a currency maintains its value because of its rarity. Julius Paulus once said, this device being officially promulgated circulates and maintains its purchasing power not so much from its substance as from its quantity. Even still, the Romans never stopped churning out more currency just like the USA today and the ancient Greeks before them. But in their race to debase, the Romans came up with some new twists of their own. The first of these twists was coin clipping. Whenever a Roman would enter a government building, they'd simply clip the edge off of their gold or silver coin. They would save up all of those clippings, melt them down, and mint more coins, expanding the currency supply. And when that wasn't enough, they developed the art of revaluation, where you just take a coin and you stamp a new value on it. You got one? 100! <laughs> that simple. The major reason for Rome's ongoing currency debasement was to pay for their ever-expanding empire and never-ending wars. The precious metals content of their coinage fell further and further until it had next to no connection with the pure gold and silver that had initially provided them with a stable economy. Cut to today and we see the same pattern. Up until the outbreak of World War I, the United States had very high levels of precious metals in its coinage, and treasury notes were backed by gold at a one-to-one -one ratio. From there, the USA debased its currency more and more to pay for World War II, the Korean War, and then the Vietnam War, until finally, the link between gold and the US dollar was severed completely. It was an unprecedented act of global debasement by a modern wannabe emperor that would make any Roman ruler hang his head in shame. 
Most people think that President Nixon's criminal activities were limited to wiretapping and spying on the competition. But his greatest crime came on August 15th, 1971, when he severed the last ties between the dollar and gold, when he ended the Bretton Woods system. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The Bretton Woods system tied all of the world's currencies to gold through the U.S. dollar. But instead of running out and hanging the guy when he took the world off of gold, the world just yawned and accepted that we were now on a fiat currency system, that we were now on this infinitely expanding system, that we no longer had money, we had currency. It is very odd that we've established a situation where what people do is scramble to borrow liabilities. Certainly, I guess, the most attractive liability in the world, or put a different way, the most attractive free trading lie on the planet is the U.S. dollar. We joke in investment conferences, it's the worst currency in the world, except all the others. If you're going to trade in a lie, it better be a liquid lie. <laughs> What the United States dollar has going for it is the most liquid lie in the world. I mean, if you think about the advantage that we have now, yes, it's, it's a horrible thing to do morally. But what we do is amazing. It's amazing that we can get away with this. We print a lie, a dream, on a piece of paper. And we ship it to Brazil, and they send us coffee. And we ship the same lie to Germany, and they send us a Mercedes. And we ship the same lie to Japan, and they ship us a stereo. It's actually a pretty cool deal. I mean, I feel bad about it in a sense, but it's, it's grandly amusing in a sort of a cosmic sense. You just need to understand that somehow, sometime, some way, there's going to be a reckoning. <laughs> seen that reckoning, right? There is a lot of built up frustration, not only inside of America, but around the world. And I think countries are starting to kind of feel that as well, too. What we are seeing happen, you know, centuries ago to what's happening now is very much this wealth concentration. And it's literally inflating assets for the rich. But this started long ago with a, t a totally different country. Um, Japan had very similar issues going into the 1980s. And what I'm going to play for you next is something that I found to be a very good kind of summary of how it started, this kind of boom, and then this bust, and then this kind of lost decade. And it's eerily similar to what people are predicting right now in the macro and micro space. Take a listen. and a simple man by the name of W. Edwards Deming. Deming worked his way through the electrical engineering program at the University of Wyoming by doing odd jobs including janitorial work. He graduated in 1921. After earning his doctorate in mathematics and mathematical physics from Yale University in 1928, Deming had a simple but revolutionary idea about how to improve the manufacturing process in factories his idea was to use statistics and quality control 
throughout the manufacturing process to improve the quality of the products. His ideas fell on deaf ears in the US. As strange as it sounds, US manufacturers at the time were finding ways to decrease the quality of their products the other way around. The concept of planned obsolescence was prevalent at the time. The idea that products needed to be created that would break down, forcing the consumer to purchase replacement at shorter intervals. A toaster that would last a lifetime was not as profitable as a toaster that would break down every few years, creating repeat business for the manufacturer. While Deming had no luck convincing US manufacturer of his ideas, he did start getting converts in Japan. At the time, Japan was in ruins, flattened by Allied bombs, two of its largest cities wiped from the face of the earth by the world's first and second use of a military nuclear attack. Japan's economy was shattered. To rebuild, Japan believed that they had to become a global exporter of high quality goods. Deming's ideas were used to create powerful manufacturing practices, and the idea of Kaizen, the constant methodical improvement of process and quality. Over the next few decades, Japan became a behemoth manufacturer of electronics and cars, carving out large chunks of the United States production economy. The period of time from the 1950s to the 1970s was known as Japan's miracle economy. The speed and duration of Japan's expansion was never before seen in any nation of the world. But like all the rapid economic expansions, around 1980, Japan's massive run started to lose steam. Its citizens started questioning the financial advancement at all costs mindset that they all shared in the decades prior. Various social movements, protests, and social unrest started increasing across the country. Many expressed outrage at the government's focus on the economy over the mounting social and environmental problems. While Japan's government tried to institute social welfare policies, many saw them as ineffective and out of touch with reality. The real estate and stock market speculation turned the nation of equals into the have and have nots. On top of all this, the Central Bank of Japan pursued an expansionary monetary policy, fueling the bubble in the stock and real estate markets. In fact, from 1985 to 1989, the Japanese stock market index saw a 218% gain over those four years, one of the largest run-ups for a developed nation. In the more and more Japanese companies relied on foreign and domestic government loans to fuel their rapid growth as banks looked for more and more people to lend their money to. What was happening to Japan in the 1980s should sound familiar to those of us living in the United States in the year 2020. It's as if we are walking in their exact footsteps and seeing the same exact events unfold in the here and now as they saw over 30 years ago in Japan. So you might be wondering, did Japan find a way to avoid a collapse? Were they able to fix the cracks in their economy? Did the house of cards that they build withstand the rising pressure? On the last market trading day of the 80s, December 29th, 1989, the Japanese bubble burst. Japan's real estate market collapsed 15 or more percent. The stock market collapsed 42% within the first year and was grinding ever lower from, was grinding ever lower from there until it's lost almost 80% of its value. The market stayed largely flat for decades after that. Japanese stocks are still lower than the highs three decades earlier. Japan did what it could, setting the interest rate at zero and increasing government spending. But the damage was done. A generation of wealth was lost. Personal bankruptcies went up. Business bankruptcies went up. Having an education and career was no longer a safe choice for financial security. This time also showed a lot of social problems, such as random violence, increase in social isolation, and a general loss of Japan's identity as a culture. Another big problem dragging down Japan's economy was the amount of so-called zombie companies that were able to exist. A zombie company is one whose income allows it to pay the interest of its debt, meaning that it's not quite dead yet, but not enough to be profitable or have any future growth prospects. Low interest rates allow these companies to exist for long periods of time 
without going bankrupt, while higher interest rates tend to flush them out, forcing them to adapt or get out of the market. Zombie companies are dangerous because they prevent younger, more innovative companies from gaining a foothold in the market, slowing down the overall economic prospects of the economy. The amount of zombie companies in the US went from near zero in the 2000s to almost 20% this year. And that number has been increasing in most of the world as well. So what things can we learn from the events that happened in the 80s and 90s in Japan? The first thing to understand is that governments can't solve everything. No matter how much money and power they wield, the market forces can change in an instance. Quick fixes often can work as a band-aid to slow the bleeding, but won't work sustainably long term. Sometimes the system has to go through its cycle and flush out all the old slow companies and allow new faster players to enter the market, allowing for faster future growth and innovation. Another thing to watch for is social unrest. Often the masses will signal that there is something wrong at the core of the system, while the economy seems to be heading higher and higher. The marriage of government and big business often means that the rest of the people will be ignored while, while the focus stays on growth and expansion. So what does this mean for the United States of America? Do we follow Japan's path to decades of slow growth and a depressed economy? Or maybe we might be able to avoid disaster and continue on our path to prosperity for many more years. At this point, I'm not sure anyone knows what the next few years will bring. But with the amount of debt, money printing, and sky-high stock valuations, it's fair to say that this balloon has been stretched to near its limit. And when it bursts, fortunes will be lost, retirements destroyed, and jobs eliminated. Right now is a great time to think about your financial situation. Are you ready to weather any storm? Or are you relying on this longest bull market in history to sustain you for many years to come? So now that we know how this is going to play out for America, or at least what people are saying is going to play out for America, let's kind of fast forward into the now. Like what's happening now? What has occurred this year? Kind of let's get caught up as to what exactly are we seeing on the front lines as far as fiscal stimulus, monetary policy, and just the macroeconomics of the world stage and what's at stake. Um, and there's no better person more qualified to talk about this than Lynn Alden. Uh, she's probably one of the most brilliant minds in the space when it comes to understanding Fed policies and really getting to the, the grit of what a lot of what they say, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, and turning it on its head and being very clear about the not only the regulatory environment, but like the federally regulated banks and how comfortable they are <laughs> with everything going on. So take a listen to Lynn Alden as she explains all of this very well. One of the kind of the dark ways to look at this period is that we've in, in some sense been in a depression for for about 12 years now and yeah. what i mean by that is if you look back at the great depression so you had the 1929 bubble 
then you had the the big fallout from there and, and it, you know we had like three years of just it just brutal the gdp went down stock market went down and it kind of bottomed in 1933 that's you know when they when they started doing that whole that whole gold depegging and all that then you started to get kind of a rebound from there so you had the stock market go up you had kind of unemployment kind of find its bottom and start to improve and you had an improvement all the way up through about 1937 and then in 1937, they had another recession. It wasn't as big as the, the previous one, but it was kind of a, they had another recession before they ever had a real boom. So they kind of, then they, you know, in 37, 38, 39, it was just kind of a really kind of a stagnant environment with slow growth. And then of course you had the, the war start in the early forties and that kind of changed everything. And you started to kind of just throw money at it and reindustrialize everything. And, and it was really kind of challenging time. So if you fast forward, after 2008, uh, so we had that, you know, we had that big fallout and then we had a rebound. So we had that recovery. However, this has been one of the, even though it's been a very long recovery, it's been a very slow growth recovery. There's not been a lot of, you know, uh, there's not been a lot of like fast GDP growth. We barely got above 3% uh, inflation adjusted GDP growth in, in the best years during the, during the past kind of decade long expansion. And if you look at labor participation rates, so unemployment rates only kind of measure people that are actively looking for jobs and can't get them. So there's kind of different ways to measure it. There's there's people that can't get any job, and then there's people that are kind of underemployed or they're they're they they, they want say full time work but they can only get part time work, for example. Okay. That's kind of another measure. It's called like the U six rate. It's another unemployment measure. Then there's people that are underemployed. So like they got a history degree. But but they're working like at, at Chipotle or something, and they right. they want to they want to have a, a job that kind of uses more of their skills, but but they they're in kind of a job that doesn't require what they what they've specialized in. So you have that underemployment problem, and then if you look at uh, another measure is just labor participation. So you take the adult population, and you can even say like between the ages of you know eighteen and sixty five, for example, and you kind of look at that and you say, okay, what percentage of those people are working? And uh, that never got back to its peak level. Uh, so we've had kind of a small share of the population working. Now, some people would, would guess logically that's because we have, we have older societies, so we have fewer people working, but it's actually somewhat been the opposite. So older people in some ways are more likely to work than they used to, which you touched on because many people can't afford to retire. On the other hand, we actually have younger people, people under 25, uh, especially men, the current the current uh, environments kind of uh, uh, kind of displaced a lot of jobs that were more traditionally male, like manufacturing. And so we actually have kind of a spike in young male unemployment. Yeah. So even even beyond the unemployment rate, it, we've had kind of just reduced labor participation. So we actually peaked in that metric back around 2000, mm. and then we declined, and then we we fell after the 2008 crisis, and we never we never really got back to those levels at all. And you know, it's it's. Partially just because we're aging, but even if you just account for age, it's really kind of kind of young people and, you know, with an emphasis on young men. And a lot of that is because of how we we structure the global reserve currency. So in order to kind of have the have the, the dollar as a global reserve currency uh, and have kind of all commodity pricing worldwide happen in dollars, we have to run pretty big trade deficits to have that happen. So as a result, we've kind of we've kind of outsourced a lot of our industrial base over the past you know, call it 40 years, even more so than some of our other advanced peers like Germany or Japan. We've kind of, we've kind of moved out a lot of those manufacturing jobs, even more so than other developed nations. You know, interesting fact is that fiat currency regimes rarely, if ever, collapse from lack of printed fiat. When the zero bound for interest rates is reached and or sovereign debt is high and they run low on real private buyers of their sovereign debt, they print. That's what the Federal Reserve does. Now, historically, high public and private debt level relative to the number of fiat currency units in the system, they increase the number of fiat currency units in the system. If you include social economic factors, it starts to get really messy. And in those extreme economic environments, there's peaks of long-term debt cycles 
and they tend to also come with peak levels of social wealth concentration. So the gap of this super rich, right, is much wider than normal. <laughs> and there's no one better to kind of cap all of this off than the financial soothsayer himself, Ray Dalio. <laughs> uh, you know, he was one of the first people back in February to start calling cash as trash. And I remember mocking him at the time when we did a thriller news and I didn't understand where he was coming from because no one saw, you know, or at least I didn't in Davos that um, COVID was going to be a thing. And so he was literally three, four five months ahead than all of us. And what he says today with this clip, I'm going to play you makes me realize like he's pretty, He's just right <laughs> most of the time, but he's always early. Take a listen. happened in 2008. I'll distinguish it. In, in, in 2008, we had banks. It, it, it's the same thing, meaning you have a certain amount of leverage, things go down, too much leverage means you're broke in the counting terms. So then you look around and you say, who are the systemically important entities that you don't want to go broke? Because do you want to lose those banks at this time? And then you can make up money and make up credit and you can keep them alive in some way. And you did it with banks, and through the banks there were the mortgages, and that's what it looked like. This is more complex than that, because there are the banks, and then there are those, all of those that are beyond banks. All of the little businesses, all of those in all the different places that are beyond it. And it's a bigger crisis, and we have a less effective monetary policy, because interest rates declines have reached their limit. And just buying financial assets by the central bank and buying the normal financial assets won't work. They have to buy the debt of the government and the government or the many governments have to be effective in getting buying power and production to those who need it around the world. Well, that's you see, that's the, that's the beauty of it. it um, there are two types, basically. There are those uh, that are sta stable, meat and potatoes, not leveraged kind of companies. You know, uh, the Campbell Soup equivalent, you know, like everybody's going to use them all time kind of thing. And then there are the innovators. The innovators, uh, um, like we're talking about Marco, you had Marco on before. And that new innovation, those who can adapt well and innovate well and don't have uh, balance sheet problems. In other words, they have strong balance sheets, so they're going to be able to play the game without having that. They will be great winners. And so there's always new inventions, new creativity. That is the new adaptation that, that becomes a company and an entrepreneur. And they're going to do great plus the stuff that we're always going to need. Those are the things that are going to do great. The markets are off, depending on what market and depending on what country you're in, you know, something in the vicinity of 25 to 45 or 50 percent, depending what currency you're managing in. And, and so if you're talking about emerging markets, they are worse because they're not going to get as much and so on. I can describe what I see, okay? We see something like, $20 trillion of uh, losses. Okay, we see, so 
um, there, if, if you work that through and you say you don't have money and you don't have credit, your business can fail. Um, you know this. We see this all around us. So there can be failures when there can't be payments. And so the question is, who gets what check to make those payments and get past it? But we're going to have a giant restructuring of the of the IOUs, and we're going to work out when hospitals um, are can go broke because this is terribly costly for hospitals, and they will not fully recover their losses. Hospitals will go broke, even though we know that they need them. So when you go, you have to go entity by entity through this, and then you'll go through the process of who will pay. So this is not. You know, some people mistake this as um, there is a, a, a virus, and the virus may come and go, okay? Maybe we never see it again. I don't think that's likely, but, I mean, the people who tell me say, it, but who knows? But if it never came back again, there will be those who are broke and, and, and who will have loss of income. We're going to change how we operate in a, in a way. The, the supply lines are going to change. In other words, self-sufficiency. What is self-sufficiency now going to mean? Do we have enough of this and that? We're going to restructure our economy and restructure the financial system in ways that we mean we are not going to go back to the way it was. this episode and I say that by not telling you what happened yesterday well the office of the comptroller of the currency as we as we know him as Brian Brooks <laughs> um, they released some guidance about stable coins on Monday providing the first detailed national kind of guidance on how cryptocurrencies backed by fiat currencies should be treated under the law and we know what he just did here recently he basically told every bank, every federally regulated bank to start feeling comfortable <laughs> with cryptocurrency and holding it. Uh, well, he's telling every uh, stablecoin issuer uh, that's being used currently in the U.S. And um, he's telling them that he knows it's been unclear in a regulatory kind of standing what the environment for stablecoins are around around the federal uh, stipulations. But he says he wants federally regulated banks to feel comfortable providing services to stablecoin issuers. It said in a press release, national banks and federal savings associations currently engage in stablecoin related activities involving billions of dollars each day. This opinion provides greater regulatory certainty for banks within the federal banking system to provide those client services in a safe and sound manner. Yes, this is more of what we knew was going to happen once Brian Brooks took hold of, of the comptroller of the currency. So you're probably wondering, Carr, where do you think this is going now that we have all these pieces in place? Well, I'm going to give you my opinion on how I think Bitcoin and crypto really fit into this. I think it's inevitable of something that we've been talking about for a while. Let's do it now. Fedcoin is inevitable. I think with what the comptroller of the currency has been doing these past couple of months, it's very, very, very likely now that central banks in the United States will have a chance to defend themselves against cryptocurrencies and now stable coins and Bitcoin. And what's going to go on with fiscal policy and the Fed is an entirely different thing. 
And Ray Dalio kind of alluded to this, and he says so much in, in such a small, compact window. But the Fed will create some facility to directly inject money to the hands of people out there who need it the most. And yes, this will put more power into the Federal Reserve, but this will also increase inflation at a higher rate and something that Lynn Alden talked about that typically happens when a country gets laden with debt. And banks will still be around, right? There will be a place for people who rely and need banks. They're, uh, they're a utility of a sorts, right? They'll become more of that in the future. But I think the vast majority of people who are above a certain age will be using fintech companies to hold their wealth, right? Through money management apps of some sort. And then you have Ethereum. And Ethereum is helping rebuild all this financial infrastructure from scratch, but not without Bitcoin. to store value, there will be nothing stronger than Bitcoin. If this new financial layer is going to be built on proof of stake and Ethereum, possibly Cardano, possibly Polkadot, you're going to need a store value. You're going to need a reserve currency for the internet. And, and that's going to be Bitcoin because of its proof of work. At the end of the day, yes, the rebuilding of this financial system from scratch is happening before our eyes on these other platforms, but it only works with Bitcoin because what you have instead is what's going on right now where Ethereum is basically the Federal Reserve. They're printing tokens, they're printing governance tokens, they're printing NFTs out of thin air and creating value. No different than what the Fed does. This is why I say all roads lead back to Bitcoin. And for one, one reason only. When it comes to Ethereum, you have to understand that being a store of value is not what it's trying to do. It's not trying to be a store of value. It's not trying to do that. It literally is just trying to be a quote unquote decentralized layer for this whole Web3 space. That's all it's trying to do. Eventually it'll evolve and turn to something else and that'll be cool, right? But it can't be a store of value because in order to be a true store of value, it has to come from an immaculate conception. It has to come from a proof of work platform. It has to be Bitcoin. And I'm not talking about rap BTC because <laughs> that's not gonna get the job done. Make no mistake, with this whole DeFi space and these, and these stable coins that are being built on Ethereum, the only thing that it's doing right now is prolonging the death of fiat. Ethereum gave the Federal Reserve an additional 10 to 15 years, possibly 20 years of printing fiat. I don't know if this is going to happen at the end of this decade, I don't know if it's going to be at the end of the next decade, but I do know there is going to be some bubble that bursts here in the next three to five years, and it's going to be massive. At that point, I do see a restructuring happen, right? And I do see a Fed coin being created, right? And I do see that as being an inevitable. But I don't think we get out of this fiat printing game until we really look at ourselves and understand what real hard currency looks like and that's bitcoin and for that that reason alone i'm bullish here in this last decade coming ahead okay
hope you guys uh, picked up on some uh, interesting takes here. But try to give you an overall sense of what's coming ahead. You know, that's ever that's all I ever try to do, especially when it comes to this macro game. It's it's so difficult to follow sometimes. It's like playing three D chess or something. <laughs> but in reality, I think we're doing we're doing just fine, right? I think as long as we stick together, as long as we share this information with each other, and as long as we're there for our families and friends and able to explain this stuff and go over it with them, I think we'll be fine. Uh, it's the people that aren't informed that I most worry about, and those are the people that you see you know, at a supermarket or the teachers that you're learning from at your school or your coworkers and family alike. Those are the people I worry about the most because they're not going to see any of this coming. They're not going to know what to do when this happens. They're just going to have to ride the wave. So make sure you go out there and share this. Do the right thing. Share it with people you care about. See you next time.